welcome to She Thinks, a podcast where you're allowed to think for yourself. I'm your host, Beverly Hallberg, and on today's Valentine's episode, Brad Wilcox, author of the new book, Get Married, joins us to discuss why he thinks marriage is the answer to the decline in happiness. He says nothing predicts happiness in life better than a good marriage, not even a hefty bank account or a great career. So we're going to look at the data, the reasons why there are more single people than in decades past, and why walking down the aisle is the best way to save civilization. Brad Wilcox is a director of the National Marriage Project and a senior fellow of the Institute for Family Studies. He's been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, National Review, among others. Brad, a pleasure to have you on She Thinks once again. It's good to be here again, Beverly. And your book is coming out soon. I believe it's on the 13th, February 13th. You're a busy man traveling the country. You are joining us from LaGuardia Airport today okay. in New York. We appreciate your time. Sure. Um, just as we jump into this, I, I thought it might be, first of all, interesting to set the stage. Of course, Valentine's Day right. is coming up. A lot of people get excited about that and a lot of people dread it. Sure. There are some people who want marriage and haven't found it, or some people who have gotten married, married and due to no fault of of their own experienced abuse or infidelity on behalf of their spouse. This is a hard subject for a lot of people, yes? Totally. That's certainly one of the challenges I think facing us is that we can't really talk easily about marriage oftentimes because it does bring up so many sensitive you know, topics that people have had difficulties in relationships, they may have had abusive you know, parents, any number of factors just make it challenging for us to kind of talk about the role that marriage and family play in our lives in this culture today. But it's an important thing to study and look at. Just curious a little bit about your background and how you got into the business of studying marriage. So Beverly, I was raised by a single mom and kind of actually in college, strangely enough, kind of had the sense that marriage was important to connect men to their kids. And so I've been kind of studying this issue primarily from kind of the perspective of how marriage affects children. But really in the last couple of years, I've been thinking a lot more about kind of the way in which new trends are making marriage more difficult for young men, and especially younger women. Talking to a lot of UVA students, females, kind of they're concerned about kind of their prospects romantically. They're concerned about the lack of kind of what they would see as sort of marriageable men or men who are interested in commitment. And so this kind of newer adult dynamic has led me to think more deeply about the re <clears throat> relationship between marriage and adult well-being. And that's certainly part and parcel of the message in the new book. And I'm sure there are many people listening to this who know plenty of single people, people who want to get married and just haven't found someone. Break down the data for us. What was marriage like, the marriage rates like, let's say, 40, 50 years ago compared to what they are today? And what is the trajectory that we're on? So, yeah. A few decades ago, between 80 and 90 percent of Americans would sort of be ever married. And we are now looking at a situation where at least kind of one in three young adults today, you know, folks in their 20s uh, will never marry. So we're kind of looking at a record share of kind of permanent bachelors and bachelorettes. And this for me is a cause for concern. And again, one reason why I'm, I'm writing the book and encouraging people to be more intentional, more deliberate, you know, more engaged when it comes to sort of finding a partner, finding a spouse. Um, in this newer and more challenging social and relationship context. And with these people who are likely to not get married in the future or not getting married now, how much of that is a personal decision? I know there is a push in, let's say, Hollywood or different areas of culture, which oftentimes does push focus on your career, especially as a female. But I also know, I, I feel, and you can tell me if I'm wrong on this, I do feel that a lot of celebrities these days do have kids, that at least parenthood is something that's encouraged, even if their marriages don't often work out, if they get married at all. Um, what is culture saying about marriage? So I think we're getting a lot of mixed messages. Obviously, there are some stories and some movies and some shows that are very marriage friendly, but we're also getting a lot of more negative portraits about marriage. One thinks of the marriage story, for instance, that Netflix movie critically acclaimed that you know, painted a very negative portrait of marriage leading to divorce. When I was finishing up my book, there was an article trending on Twitter uh, from Bloomer that said women who stay single and don't have kids are getting richer. And not only that kind of suggests that women who steered clear of family were better off financially, but it also kind of gave us a portrait of single childless women kind of just killing it emotionally as well. So I think there are also kind of voices out there that are more what I would sort of describe as anti-nuptial and anti-natal, not very, not very friendly towards marriage and motherhood. And we actually see a new survey from the Center for American Culture indicating that 
a majority now of adults think that women are not benefiting emotionally from getting married and having kids. And that trend is particularly salient. That sort of polling trend is especially salient for uh, young women in America today. So I think there are a, a lot of folks out there who have kind of a more skeptical view about sort of the role and value of marriage, which then can shape their kind of interest in and their engagement with getting married as well. And do you think part of this as well is is that more and more women are educated these days and do have careers? And so I've seen studies before where they say where women want to marry somebody who is on par with them, let's say in education or career level. Some um, studies or even some reports point to men maybe not feeling manly enough to marry somebody who has a better career than them. How much is the rise of women getting college degrees and having fruitful careers part of the problem? So it's certainly part of the dynamic because I think most women would tend to prefer to marry someone who's kind of at their level or even higher in terms of you know education and income. But obviously in today's world, we're seeing that women on average are outpacing men when it comes to education. Now income is obviously a more complicated story there. But I do think kind of the broader set of dynamics financially and educationally have made it harder for women to find someone who kind of meets their standards. And that's one factor that's driving marriage down. Of course, it's also important to note that marriage is lowest now among working class and poor women. And I think that's part of, partly because in their social circles, they're more likely to be kind of finding men who are not employed full time. And that's, uh, you know, a, you know, women still even, you know, in 2024 are looking for guys who are kind of reliable uh, breadwinners in some, you know, meaningful capacity. And so the kinds of issues we're talking about are even more salient for working class and poor women than they are for more educated women who tend to have access to men who would be either more educated and or you know better earners and more <clears throat> kind of reliably connected to uh, to full time work. And do you find that there is just a decline, um, or maybe we should look into this? Why is there a decline more of marriageable men, like you said, men who aren't as reliable? How does this factor into the drug epidemic that we've seen? How does this factor in that I think there has been a, a bashing culture on men and saying that masculinity is toxic? Have we just messed men up as a whole in so many ways? That's part of the story, Beverly. I mean, I think when you look at our schools, this is striking. You know, I've, I've got middle school age kids. And when you go to the student kind of, you know, ceremonies at the end of the year, it's always the case that the girls are dominating. Uh, if you look at, you know, who is at my university, a clear majority of my students are now female. So there's kind of like these broader dynamics playing out that for a variety of reasons, have kind of put men at a bit of a disadvantage when it comes to schooling and college and getting a strong start in the labor force. And then I would also kind of talk about the impact of what I call electronic opiates, you know, things like xbox and other kind of gaming devices that tend to i think sidetrack a lot of teenage boys and then as you also kind of touched on i think we don't kind of give teenage boys and young men kind of a clear and compelling model of masculinity that's pro-social and so if they're thinking about kind of what does it mean to be a man <clears throat> they might even migrate obviously someone like andrew tate who kind of gives us a much more atavistic and anti-social model of masculinity so there are a lot of different cultural and technological and educational factors that help to explain why a lot of males are floundering today vis-a-vis -vis the females in their uh, in their circles. And how do you think the virtual world plays a role in this? Obviously, there's the online dating aspect of this, but there's also that we've gone more virtual with so many things due to COVID and how our lives have adapted to a virtual world after. That lack of human connection, somebody in front of you, how is that impacting whether or not people do find somebody to marry? Yeah, I think that's huge. I mean, I think just the rise of smartphones has made dating a lot more challenging. And for a couple of reasons, number one is people are just not spending as much time together in person in a variety of social different contexts. They're dating less in person. I think that a lot of the dating apps tend to kind of basically call from the cream of the crop and kind of sideline a lot of sort of folks who are more in the middle or the lower tier of some kind of, you know, arbitrary attractiveness, you know, criteria. Um, and then we also know too, that people are more likely to be happily married when they meet in person rather than when they meet, um, you know, online through some kind of dating app. You're just kind of getting a lot more information, a lot more input on a potential partner when you meet in person. So all these things I think help to explain why kind of the rise of smartphones is corresponding to um, a decline in dating and probably, you know, a longer term decline in marriage as well. 
And so when you look at the, the data points and the stats on those who desire marriage and those who don't, do you think that there is a decline in desire for marriage or this is more about a decline in people feeling like they have a good option, somebody who shares their values that matches well with them on a variety of different levels? So Beverly, I think it depends on the person, obviously. So there are plenty of like sort of serious you know, young women who I know who are really oriented towards um, dating and marriage and are having difficulty finding someone to kind of, you know, make the bar. But we also, I think, are seeing a broader cultural shift towards what I call a Midas mindset, where people are prioritizing, you know, education and work and success over love and marriage. Pew data, for instance, tell us that people think that a job is more likely to lead to fulfillment than marriage today. And that's, that's actually false. So that kind of Midas mindset is also um, part and parcel of, of the challenge facing us in the culture at large. And so you equate being married and happily married to leading to overall happiness. So when someone doesn't get married, what are some of the negative trends that you find in those individuals? And is it the same for men and women? So what I find basically is that there is a pretty big difference between uh, married women and single women. And what's I think particularly striking though, given kind of a lot of the discourse in the media and on social media is that actually married moms are the happiest. They're about twice as happy as their single and childless peers, for instance. Um, also when it comes to meaning, uh, married moms report a majority of them report that their lives are meaningful most or all the time. Only a minority of single childless women would say that. Then when it comes to loneliness, single millennial women are twice as likely to say that they're lonely often compared to married millennial women. So on a number of key indicators, even though marriage has and motherhood often get kind of bad press, um, kind of in the real world, what we see is that as difficult as being a spouse can be, as difficult as being a parent or mom can be, uh, you know, sacrifices, hassles, you know, sleep, all that kind of stuff. It's still the case that I think, you know, um, we're hardwired to connect. And so when we are able to, you know, get married and have kids, we're more likely to flourish. And that's true for women as well as men. Now, in terms of the happiness story, it's pretty similar. Um, you know, both women and men who are married are about twice as likely to be, you know, very happy, for instance, compared to their uh, single peers. But to be honest, the effect is a little bit more powerful for men than it is for women on the happiness front. So that's, but there's just no question, again, that married moms are doing better on a number of different fronts. Loneliness, meaning, happiness, their financial you know, position compared to their single peers. Do you find that the, the women who are mothers and are married, that the happiness goes up if they're not working full time as well? Have you studied any of the correlation? And I ask this because I see a lot of Instagram videos, at moms out there who say, I can't do it all. It's I'm cleaning, I'm cooking, I'm working full time, taking care of the kids being a wife, that there are a lot of pressures and demands put on, on a, a mother to be a working mom. Yeah, so I think there's kind of two different dynamics in play there. One is just kind of the stresses that we would see with you know juggling marriage and motherhood and work. Um, but another kind of big piece here is just sort of people's general orientation towards work and family. And so I think when women have a kind of a more domestic orientation or a more traditional orientation, working part-time or being at home, would be kind of aligned with more happiness. It's kind of like their <clears throat> their preference is being realized in the real world. But if women are kind of more strongly oriented towards career, um, they're going to try to make it at work. And if they have a supportive husband, you know, um, you know, then that's going to be typically the route to happiness for them. So there's just, I mean, obviously we all know we live in a very pluralistic society. Women are different and you know, it's important. I mean, conservatives would often stress one pattern and progressives another pattern on this issue that you just asked. But I'm just saying, when you look at the data, a lot of it really depends upon the women's worldview, their preferences, and how they're aligning with what they're doing in the workplace, but also with kind of how helpful their husbands are in kind of making the whole thing work. Well, it's interesting to note in terms of this issue that both conservative women, moderate women, and liberal women who are moms are markedly happier when their husbands are deeply engaged in caring for the kids, you know, really engaged fathers, basically. The division of housework, not, not a big deal. It just depends more on your ideology. But across the board, we see that women who are married to guys, and when they have kids um, who are deeply engaged dads, are <clears throat> much better off marriage-wise.
Yeah, there's a word that you keep using, which is supportive, that that supportive aspect. And that could be it's different for each person, each couple. Sure. Um, something else that you touch on in the book that I think is interesting is is talking about one of the benefits of marriage is not only do they tend to be wealthier. So whether that's two incomes or one income and a stay at home mom, let's say, or there's this other side, which you said, those the couples that actually have joint accounts that merge their finances together, that think of it as one, tend to be happy. Why is that? Yeah, well, I, I mentioned in the book, there's a lot of kind of me first thinking in the culture. And I talk about Susie Norman, for instance, the well-known financial guru. And she advises couples to kind of keep their separate accounts. We've got actually really good, even experimental evidence on this, Beverly, that tells us the couples who are merging their money are more likely to be flourishing. I think it's kind of part and parcel of kind of a we before me mindset that runs against many of the sort of themes in our culture today. And couples who can kind of can build this sort of teamwork mentality and practically embody that in things like, for instance, shared accounts are more likely to be flourishing. And I think it's in part because they have to talk through financial challenges, you know, share what's going on in their lives financially. And they also have a sense, too, that they're building a common financial future together. And then also oftentimes one partner is you know, earning more money than the other partner. And if you've got separate accounts, that can generate, I think, a sense of resentment, too. So. Bottom line is kind of this we before me approach to money and other things in marriage is typically more uh, fruitful for couples. And something else that I think is is interesting that you touched on is the ripple effect of strong marriages or the lack thereof. And you talk about what this means for communities. You correlate this to what this means for decline in safety and other issues related to the community. What have you found in, in relation to those marriage and what happens to the communities? Yeah, so it's striking really. There's a lot of evidence telling us that when neighborhoods have more like married parent families, there's less crime, there's less incarceration. Um, Raj Chetty at Harvard has found that kind of the number one predictor of mobility for poor kids kind of rising, realizing the American dream, you know, being poor as a child and being successful as an adult, you know, the best predictor there is again, two parent families. And we've got new evidence from the University of Chicago telling us that there's been a dip in happiness across the country since about 2000. And the number one factor that explains that decline in happiness um, is that there are fewer and fewer Americans who are married. So that kind of classic Jeffersonian pursuit, the pursuit of happiness, is now more challenging for Americans because fewer of us are, um, are putting a ring on it. And you say that marriage, getting married, is the best way to save civilization and defy the elites. Why do you make that claim? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. When I first kind of you know, put up the, the title on Twitter, got a lot of pushback, um, including from some prominent progressive media elites. And, and they're like, well, elites are doing great at marriage. What are you talking about, Brad? And my point is that our elites often talk left and walk right when it comes to marriage and family. I've got a piece coming out in The Atlantic next week that kind of makes this case in more detail. But when you look at something, just go back to Netflix. I mentioned that, you know, Netflix produced this kind of <clears throat> movie called The Marriage Story that gave us a very negative portrait of marriage. Now, the irony there is, you know, that the co-founder of Netflix, Reed Hastings, um, in his autobiography, wrote about how he and his wife had difficulties around his heavy travel schedule. But they went to a, a marital counselor. They worked through those issues. They figured out some, you know, some routine, some way of handling all of this. They've got two kids, been married 30 plus years. It's just kind of an example of how in their private lives, a lot of our elites are actually very kind of marriage minded living what I'd call family first lives. But when it comes to kind of their public positions, be they professors, school superintendents, you know, um, CEOs, um, <clears throat> journalists, whatever, they're often kind of not, you know, preaching what they practice. And so those who are listening to this, they agree with you. They say, I think marriage is important. What advice do you give to people who maybe personally are struggling to find a partner or somebody who is married trying to encourage maybe their niece or their son or something like that? What are the steps somebody can take to defy some of those odds? Like you said, one in three, I think you said women, um, only one and in men. three will get, and yeah, men, so, only one in three yeah. will get married. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I think, um, you know, one thing that's really important to do is is not to listen to parents and to professors and peers who would tell you that you should wait until you're, you know, 28 or 30 to really get serious about getting married. I mean, I talk to a lot of students at UVA who kind of will tell me that their parents have told them they should not focus on love or relationship 
not to mention, of course, marriage, you know, when they're at the University of Virginia. And I'm not saying you should get married at 21. I'm just saying that, like, being at college, for instance, is a great place to meet a lot of people. And you should be open to, I think, you know, dating and love and developing a serious relationship, whether you're in college or whether you're, you know, in a job in your early 20s or pursuing an MBA, whatever it might be, um, and not just kind of assume you can kind of reach age 28 or 30 and just turn around and find the perfect partner. So one thing is just to kind of recognize that tw 20s are a pretty cr critical decade for you know, many of us and that you should be open in your 20s to finding that, you know, <clears throat> that permanent partner in terms of marriage. I think it's also the case, too, though, that we have to be kind of more intentional about letting family and friends who we trust um, today kind of know that we're interested in getting married and, you know, help them kind of do some of that old school matching, you know, the yeah. matchmaker kind of thing. Um, you know, I did that recently with a graduate student at UVA and was pleased to kind of see him, you know, um, in the wake of a conversation about being more intentional about, you know, dating and, you know, and in, in our, in our local community, you know, walking around <clears throat> UVA's grounds with a, um, you know, with a young woman. So we just have to be, I think, more kind of cognizant of like the new challenges facing us. The fact that there is this closing of the American heart, unfortunately, unfolding and do all that we can to kind of be proactive in not being caught up in a, a larger social you know, pattern that you don't want to um, kind of come to characterize and describe your life. And so final question for you is, does the whole Taylor Swift, Travis Kelsey love story give you hope that they might actually get married in the near future? Yeah, I've got a piece in the Wall Street Journal coming out um, this weekend coming up on that whole subject. So you have to kind of read that um, that piece to get the full story there from my perspective. But yeah, it would be great if they, um, you know, if they've got a good relationship, a good friendship, um, if they understand and appreciate it, as I, as I argue in the journal, that love is about more than a feeling. Sure. Love is a decision to basically pursue the good of the other, including any kids that you might have down the road. So if they, as long as they kind of can shift from that I mean, romance is awesome, great, beautiful, but it's not enough to sustain a marriage. So that's that's the kind of point that I make in the journal this weekend. And your book comes out February 13th. People can right. go ahead and pre-order it now. Who is this book for? Do you have to be an intellect to read this? No, my uh, my agent, uh, Howard Yoon, was just brutal and just making sure that you know the book is really aimed at a, a more general audience. There's a lot of stories in the book. There are a few parables, story, you know, kind of like, I talk about Odysseus, you know, um, and the sirens, you know, so there's, it's, it's aimed at a, at a more general audience. This book well, Brad Wilcox, author of Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families and Save Civilization. We appreciate you joining us today. Thanks for having me, Beverly. And thank you all for joining us. Before you go, IWF does want you to know that we rely on the generosity of supporters like you. An investment in IWF fuels our efforts to enhance freedom, opportunity, and well-being for all Americans. So please consider making a small donation to IWF by visiting iwf.org backslash donate. That's iwf.org backslash donate. Last, if you enjoyed this episode of She Thinks, do leave us a rating or a review. It does help. And we love it if you shared this episode so your friends can know where they can find more She Thinks. From all of us here at Independent Women's Forum. Thanks for watching.